passage this morning from Acts chapter uh, 13. Uh, <clears throat> verses 13 through 23, I originally intended just to focus on verse 22, but as I was working through the context, I thought, well, here's another great example. It has several lessons for us in it, and the two really fit together. We have an example of Paul uh, evangelizing in the synagogue, and as he does, he, he's working his way through Israel's history, and he comes to David, and he talks about how David is a man after God's own heart and how he brings Jesus through this man and so forth, and he's, of course, bringing the gospel into his presentation. That's what evangelism is all about. But I originally intended just to deal with David, but I thought, well, here's a great example of evangelism as well. And really, they fit together, of course, because the Lord wants us to evangelize. But we need to be a certain kind of person to evangelize. We need to be like Jesus, and that's exactly what David was. So that's how I'm going to fit these two ideas uh, together. But let's begin by reading the passage, and it's in, again in Acts chapter 13, verses 13 through 23. This is what we read. Now Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. But John left them and returned to Jerusalem. And going on from Perga, they arrived at Pisidian Antioch. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading of the law and the prophets, the synagogue officials sent to them, saying, Brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it. Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, by the way, that means Jews and God-fearing Gentiles, listen, the God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he led them out from it. For a period of about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. When he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land as an inheritance, all of which took about 450 years. After these things, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years. After he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, concerning whom he also testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. From the descendants of this man, according to promise, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus. Now, we'll, we'll go ahead and stop there because that is really... It just gives us, again, an example of, of how Paul went about evangelizing, how he took what they knew and tied it to the one he wanted to proclaim, uh, that is Jesus. But again, as I've already mentioned this morning, we have two purposes in, in our text. We want to do two things. First of all, we want to see how Paul evangelized to give us an example and an encouragement to, to do it, okay, an example of how to do it and to be encouraged to, to do it. And secondly, we want to consider David's life to look at three aspects of his character, his spiritual character, to remind us of what it is we need to be if we are to share the gospel with others effectively. And I would say we need these three things if we're going to share the gospel at all because if we don't have them, we're not going to do it. But we certainly need these things to do it effectively. Now, first of all, let's consider how Paul evangelized. In our passage, we see Paul and those who were with him uh, go to the synagogue on a Sabbath day. This would be the Old Testament Sabbath, which would be Saturday. And notice that Paul was not going there to worship, okay? At least not in the sense that we usually think of worship. He didn't go there to do what we are here doing this morning. He went there specifically for the purpose of evangelizing. Now, I brought that out just because on Wednesday evening, as we were looking at the early church, uh, the ancient church history with, uh, by Bob Godfrey, uh, we learned that many of the Jewish believers in the early church went both to the synagogue on Saturday and to the church on Sunday. And when they went to the synagogue on Saturday, they weren't necessarily going there for worship, I mean for, for evangelism, they were actually going there to worship. They apparently had a hard time grasping the differences that the new covenant uh, 
had made. And Godfrey pointed out that they did this for nearly two centuries. They, you know, they had this, this particular issue, and it was an issue because the Jewish rabbis didn't want the Christians in the synagogue. And the Christian pastors didn't want their people going to the synagogue because, again, it represented uh, the idea that they just didn't know what had taken place in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what this tells us is, is this, that when the Lord brings us to the truth, you know, thinking about these, these Christians that did this, we do need to make a break from the things that we used to believe were true, even if these things are ingrained in us, even if we were raised up in them. What, wherever these truths may have come from, whether they came from a religion that we happen to be raised in, such as they were in the Old Covenant Judaism, or whether it be a particular philosophy, or whether it just simply be those so-called truths that the world holds to. The Lord Jesus in his work has saved us not only from judgment, the judgment that our guilt would have brought upon us, but he has also saved us from the lies that we believed. He's opened our eyes to the truth so that we can now live in a way that's pleasing to him and a way that will bring blessing to us, and we'll see a bit more about that this evening. Now, the fact that the Jewish Christians continue to worship in the synagogues is precisely why Paul, when he was Saul the Pharisee, went to the high priest and asked for these letters that he might go to Damascus to purge the synagogues of these heretics. Remember, we saw that just a week or two ago. Why were they there? Well, because of this confusion. But now we see him again going to the synagogue, only this time not to arrest the Christians he might find there, but to convince the Jews to become Christians to convince them that Jesus is their Messiah. Let me just note what we noted before there, and that is the new birth brings a new direction. Paul was on his way to Damascus to arrest, imprison, and eventually execute Christians, and the Lord turned his direction around to the point where he now wanted to go to the synagogues to try to convince the rest of the Jews to become a Christian like he had just become. When we come to the Lord Jesus, he changes our direction Radically, I mean 180 degrees, we go the opposite direction. Now, we should also know this, that the Jews often proved to be Paul's toughest audience. They also proved to be the most dangerous people that he went to. Uh, but he still went to them because, as he expresses his heart in uh, Romans chapter 9, these were his countrymen. And he was willing even to be cast away from the Lord that these might come to know the Lord. He loved them, and he was reaching out to them even though just about every time he did, they turned on him and abused him in some way. Now, again, this is an important part of evangelism, isn't it? Because we know the people we're going out to evangelize aren't necessarily going to like that message that we're bringing, but we need to care about them enough to do that. May the Lord give us that kind of love to reach out to them and be willing to risk this. But we also see, as I said, something here about Paul's methodology. How did Paul go about convincing them that Jesus was the Christ? Well, to put it simply, he connected Jesus to their history. And he showed how Jesus was the fulfillment of everything that God had done for them. Now, first of all, he reminded them of the great blessings that God had given to them as a people. He was the one who had chosen their fathers, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, out of his love and his mercy and his grace. He goes, he, you know, on one occasion, God says, I think it's to Moses, that he didn't choose the Israel because they were more numerous than anybody else. They were the fewest. He chose them because of his mercy and grace. That's the way he chooses anyone. It's not because of them. It's because of him. So God chose them, and he made his covenant with them. He promised to give them the land of Canaan. He promised that they would become many, a very numerous people, and that there would be one among them in particular through whom all the nations of the earth would be blessed. He promised that the Messiah would come through their line. And Paul, uh, as he's going through this history, is pointing out that God kept this covenant with them. When the famine came... He brought them into Egypt and he provided for them there. He brought them in as only a few people, but that's where they grew into many. When Pharaoh took advantage of them, he delivered them out of Egypt. 
when they failed to trust him to bring them into the land, he still fulfilled his promise by bringing their children into the land. When they turned to idols, he disciplined them by bringing foreign armies against them. And when they turned to him again, he delivered them through the judges that he raised up. All of this is included in what Paul says here. And then finally, during the time of Samuel, when they asked for a king, he gave them a king. He gave them Saul, the Benjamite. And even this was a part of God's faithfulness because it was meant to teach them a lesson. You know, for any thinking Israelite, they would have known that from the beginning, this could not be the king that God had promised. Remember, before Saul came, before the people even asked for a king, God had promised to give them a king in the Old Testament. And he said specifically that king would come from the tribe of Judah. And yet we see here Saul is a Benjamite and the Lord ordains him to be king. So that should have made it clear to the people of God this was not the king that God actually intended to give them. It was really meant to teach them a lesson. And when Saul showed himself to be unworthy, the Lord removed him and gave them David. He gave them one from the tribe of Judah, as he had promised. He gave them one who was a man after his own heart, from whom he would raise up the promised king, the real promised king, that is Jesus, the Savior. And you see how Paul leads from God's choice and his covenant and his faithfulness and the idea of this king to the fulfillment of all these things in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so from there, he proceeds to preach the gospel. Now again, this was Paul's method with the Jews. When we evangelize, we can use a similar approach. We need to have some kind of a plan when we come up to people and talk with them. With our audience, though, I think we should begin in a different place because usually we're not speaking to Jewish people. We should speak, I think, beginning with uh, what God has revealed of himself in nature, you know, to show them that God exists. That's what Paul did when he was on Mars Hill with the Greek philosophers. You kind of start with where they're at, right? And then you take them from where they are and you bring them to Jesus. We can point out that God exists we can show them from the creation what he is like. We can show them how good he is in giving to us everything that we need to live. And we can particularly show his goodness in sending his son to live and to die while we were still in rebellion against him so that if we would just receive him, we would not perish but live forever. We take what they know and we connect it to Jesus. Now, some people come from a church background. If they do, we can, you know, know something of that church background and we know there are things in common. We can draw from that and we can bring that to Jesus as well. But the one thing we always need to do is bring the message to Jesus. Don't stop with arguments for God's existence, you know, natural revelation. Don't, don't start or stop with presuppositional arguments. Everything has to be done from the standpoint that God exists, the gospel is true, and we need to get this person to see that it's true. Now again, remember, the gospel is not a popular message. It's never been a popular message. There are going to be those who hate us when we share the gospel with them. But remember, it's also the only message that God uses to save. And unless they hear it, they will have no opportunity to escape an eternity of suffering for their sins. We need to remember that. They, if they do not hear the gospel, are going to perish. If they hear it and they don't receive Jesus, they're also going to perish. But let's not be a part of the reason why they perish. Let's make sure we bring them the gospel. If we have it, let's make sure we share it. As Jesus said in the parable of the seed sower, let's have that bag of seed ready at all times to sow to as many people as we can. Don't expect to be popular. If you're after popularity, you're never going to be a good evangelist because people aren't going to like you for this. But if you want to be popular with God, if you want to be a man after God's own heart, this, this is what we need to do, you see. We need to love, we need to care about them, we need to go, and we need to try to convince them that they need Jesus because they really do need Jesus even if they don't think they do. They need Jesus, and it's only by confronting them that they will ever come to him. Now, that's the first point. There's the methodology. We also need, secondly, a life 
that in some way reflects what we are calling other people to be. We need to be like Jesus. Now, we certainly saw this in Paul's life. Remember, we saw, I think it was last week, how the Lord changed his direction. We just reviewed that a bit. We also saw what he began to pursue, how he trusted Jesus alone, how he no longer trusted his own works, how he sought to become like Jesus and press forward to become what Jesus called him to be. We see this also in the life of David because David was a type of Jesus. That's why he was called a man after God's own heart. God didn't want Saul. He wanted David. Why did he want David? Because David was like him. David was what he wanted the king to be, somebody who was like his son. And, of course, David was only like his son because of God's grace. Now, I would say that David pictured Jesus in many ways, but let me just point out three. First of all, in his obedience, David loved the Lord. And so he wanted to please the Lord. And he knew that the only way he could please the Lord was by obeying him. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, the reason why God rejected Saul, remember, was not just because he was from the tribe of Benjamin, but it was because he wouldn't obey him. He actually said, if you were paying attention here, actually, we're going to read it in just a moment, that if he had obeyed him, he would have established his kingdom. Okay, that, that would have been the consequence of his obedience, but he didn't obey. That was the problem. We read in 1 Samuel 13, verses 13 and 14, which is the culmination of what we read, Samuel said to Saul, you've acted foolishly in offering this sacrifice. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not endure. The Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has appointed him as ruler over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Do you see the cause and effect here? Sometimes we think God's decree completely wipes out cause and effect. Doesn't matter what I do. Doesn't matter if I'm good or bad. Doesn't matter how I live. If I'm going to be saved, I'm going to be saved. I'm going to go to heaven, so forth. It does matter how you live. It makes a big difference. Not with justification, mind you but certainly with how the Lord's going to use us. Now, Samuel, or excuse me, Saul secondly was supposed to destroy Amalek, remember, and everything that belonged to him, but again, he didn't, and so the Lord rejected him. Samuel said in 1 Samuel 15, verses 22 and 23, has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination and insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He has also rejected you from being king. Saul was not rejected because he was a Benjamite. Saul was rejected because he would not obey the Lord. He was not a man after God's own heart. Saul was a disobedient king. And as such, would not be the picture that the Lord wanted of the king who was coming, the Lord Jesus Christ. But God knew of somebody who would, and that was David. And here's where we read in our text in Acts 13, verse 22. After he had removed him, that is Saul, he raised up David to be their king, concerning whom he also testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, notice, who will do all my will. That's one part of being a man after God's own heart, a woman after God's own heart, a child after God's own heart, is that you do the will of God. Now, we're going to focus on that a bit more this evening to see just how precisely we should, how carefully we should obey the Lord to be a man after God's own heart, one who truly loves him. But secondly, as I said, there are three things. Secondly, David trusted the Lord. Remember what we saw a few weeks ago, that Asa, who was a son of David, a descendant of David, king of Judah, didn't trust the Lord 
to solve the problem he was faced with, the blockade that Baasha had set up. He looked to Ben-Hadad instead and trusted him. And this is what the Lord said to him in 2 Chronicles 16, verses 7 through 9. And again, this is all review of what we've been looking at, and we need to remember these things. He says this, because you have relied on the king of Aram and have not relied on the Lord your God, therefore the army of the king of Aram has escaped out of your hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubim an immense army with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. You have acted foolishly in this. Indeed, from now on, you will surely have wars. When Asa earlier was faced with, with an army of a million men, he looked to the Lord. He was out number two to one. He looked to the Lord, and the Lord delivered him with very little effort on his part. But now, a much smaller problem, he looks to somebody else. God is looking for someone who will trust him. And when God looked at David, that's what he found, somebody who trusted him. And so the Lord supported him, strongly supported him. That's why David was able to do the things that he did. I mean, we look at David and we say, what a great example of somebody who did great things. How was he able to do it? He trusted the Lord would help him, and he actually stepped out and did something. How is it that David was able, to, with, with his sling, to kill a lion? I mean, a lion's a pretty tough animal. How was he able to kill the bear? How was he able to stand up against Goliath? Remember, Goliath was a giant. Saul and the whole army of Israel were terrified by him and would not come out. Every day he came out and issued his challenge. But when David saw him, he said, Who is this, who is this guy who's, who's taunting the armies of Israel? Why doesn't somebody go out there and kill this guy? Well, if nobody will do it, I will do it. The God who delivered the lion and the bear into my hand will also deliver this Philistine, this uncircumcised Philistine, into my hands. That was not boastfulness and pride on the part of David. That was trusting in the Lord. This, by the way, was also how David was able to spare Saul. Remember how he, the Lord essentially providentially led Saul into a place where David could have killed him. This is when Saul was chasing David and wanted to kill him. But he wouldn't do it. And the reason why he wouldn't do it is because he trusted that the Lord would, in his time, deal with Saul. We're not supposed to take our own revenge. We're supposed to leave that in the hands of God. He left it in the hands of God, and God dealt with it. Yes, Saul died because God ordained it. And David became king. That happened because David trusted in the Lord. So David obeyed, and David trusted and then thirdly, let's just note that he also cared. David cared for God's people. When he was the commander of Saul's army, he fought to protect the people of Israel. When he was exiled by Saul, remember, and he was basically wandering in the wilderness and people gathered to him, he pretended to be a servant of Achish, the Philistine king of Gath, and that king gave him Ziglag as a, as a headquarters, and he went out and used that position to fight against Israel's enemies. At the same time, he was killing the enemies of the Philistine king, perhaps sometimes even his allies. He um, was doing it to protect Israel. And when he became king, he continued to protect them. So David cared about the well-being of his people. But perhaps his greatest care was demonstrated in his spiritual care, you know, basically his care for their souls. If there's one thing that stood out about David is that he led God's people in worship. We read earlier in Psalm 132, I should have given a little bit of the background of that psalm, but it was really about bringing the ark back into Jerusalem. And this was after it was foolishly taken out and given to the Philistines. And uh, actually the Philistines took it because they, they took it out there thinking if the ark was out there in the battle against the Philistines, God would give them victory. But instead, they were defeated. The ark was taken. God then judges the Philistines. The Philistines returned it to, uh, to Israel, and it was kept in the house of Obed-Edom. But eventually, David wanted to move it into Jerusalem, and that's what that psalm was about. And when he did that, after the little th you know, the thing that happened with regard to Uzzah, of course, uh, he was the one who led the procession rejoicing before the ark. Uh, 
And he was so thankful that, that this symbol of God's presence was back with Israel. He was the one who wanted to build a house of worship for God. That was his desire. But the Lord said, you're a man of bloodshed. You can't do this, but I will raise up one from you who will build my house. And he was talking about Solomon, but he was looking beyond Solomon. He was talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. But even though the Lord would not allow him to build this house, David made every preparation, gathered all the expensive materials together so that his son Solomon would be able to do it easily because David loved the Lord and he wanted to promote the worship of God. He wanted to build that temple. You know, David wrote also most of the Psalms that we have in the book of Psalms. And those Psalms, remember, are songs that the people of God used for worship. Uh, he wrote so many of them that he was actually called or known as the sweet psalmist of Israel. So David cared for the physical but especially the spiritual well-being of God's people. He trusted the Lord. He obeyed the Lord. His heart was for the Lord. And that's why the Lord calls him a man after his own heart. Now let's come back to this question because this is perhaps the most important question that we'll look at this morning. And that is how did David become this kind of man? Now, as I've said before, we tend to think that it was purely because of God, his plan, his will. He just made David that way. He wanted a king from the line of Judah. He wanted him to be a godly man so that he could be a picture of his son. He wanted him to have his son's character. He wanted to show what, what his son's rule would bring. And so he made a man like that. David really had no choice in the matter. Well, that isn't true. Okay. It is true to a degree. He did choose David. It was, part, it was his plan and so forth. But there's a reason why God chose David from among all the men of Judah. There were plenty. I mean, he wasn't in any kind of royal line. The, 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 the kingship was only as old as Saul, and that was from Benjamin. There was no royal dynasty. There was no royal line. It could have been anyone from Judah. But he chose David because of the kind of man that David was. Now, in a very real sense, David was no different than we are. He was a sinner. So that's how he came into the world, Psalm 51, saved by the grace of God. He was no different. But, as the Puritans like to put it, he improved the grace that God gave to him. And that simply means this, that he used it to become the kind of man that God could use. And what do I mean by that? Well, when God gave him love for him, that, that's what he gives to everyone who belongs to him. But David yielded to that love, and he let that love lead him to do the things that he should do. He read, as we know from the Psalms, he read and he meditated on God's word. He saw in God's law what it is that God wanted him to do, and he did it. He saw in the same law what God didn't want him to do, and he made sure he avoided it. He saw the promises of God, and he trusted the Lord to do those things, the things that were beyond his ability. He couldn't kill a lion. He couldn't kill a bear. He couldn't fight against Goliath on him, by himself, but he knew that God could. I mean, Goliath was nothing to God. Remember when the people of Israel came up to the land of promise, up to the border, and they sent the 12 spies in? And the spies returned, and there were ten that said, these people are far too great and mighty. Their walls go up to heaven. We're like grasshoppers. They're like giants. There's no way we're going to win. And then there were two that weren't looking at themselves and weren't looking at them, but they were looking at God. And they said, these people are nothing to him. We can go in there and easily take it. But they listened to the, to the ten, and that whole generation then perished. The difference is that there were those two that trusted the Lord and there were the ten who didn't trust the Lord. David trusted the Lord. He trusted him to do the things that he could not do on his own. David prayed. David sought the Lord. And through all these things, he came to know the Lord. He came to know him intimately, more intimately. I'm not talking about the beginning of his relationship, but the deepening of that relationship, making it a richer relationship, he came to know the Lord in such a way that the Lord could use him. Now, the Lord chose David because he knew David would be such a man, that by his grace he would become 
what he was, which is why in all eternity he chose David to be king as one who would be a picture of his son. Now, we do understand that doesn't mean that David was perfect. David was far from perfect. No one on this side of heaven is perfect. David fell into some pretty serious sin, which was to remind us that he was just a picture. He was not the reality. But his life does teach us many things about Jesus and so many things about what the Lord wants us to be. Okay? He wants us to be like him. He wants us to be like Jesus so that we can show the world what the gospel can actually do. And so, as we move forward in serving the Lord, as he calls us to through sharing the gospel, let's remember these things. First of all, let's be bold. Now I'm going back to uh, Paul's example. As Paul was willing to speak to those who would most likely reject what he had to say and injure him, let's be willing to share the gospel with those whom the Lord brings into our, into our paths. Let's, when we share the gospel, connect the gospel message to the things that they're already familiar with. If they have a church background, appeal to that knowledge. If they don't have a church background, then to what God reveals in His creation, His power and His goodness and His patience to lead them to Jesus through the gospel. And let's not just tell them about Jesus, let's show them what, who Jesus is, what He's like. Let's work like David did, improve the grace God has given to us and work at becoming a man, a woman, or a child who is after God's own heart. One that as he looks throughout the earth to see if there's one whose heart is completely his, that he would find that heart in us. Let's do our best with God's help to practice what we preach. To obey his word so that we might show the world what the gospel can actually do in the lives of those who believe. And like David, let's also trust the Lord to help us. I mean, again, think about what David did. This was a real person, David. He really existed. And he really did kill the lion, the bear, and the giant. Now, if David could do that, then surely by trusting in the Lord, we can face our family members and our neighbors and people with, with whom we work and tell them about Jesus. And above all, let's love. Let's care about people, care enough about them, to reach out to them, to reach out to them, you know, not only with food and clothing when we see them in need, which is, you know, what we do as a, as a church, but also with that message, the only message that can save them from something else that's also very real, and that is hell. Everybody who dies without Christ goes to hell, and they are there forever, except for the day of judgment, which will be a brief, re, re, you know, uh, repri well, what do you call it, just relief, from that suffering, but not so much a relief when you have to stand before the Lord and be condemned for all of your sins, but then go back into the lake of fire where they will suffer forever in body and in soul. The gospel is the only message that can actually save them from that future. Sharing the gospel with them is not going to necessarily save them, but they will never be saved without hearing the gospel. So we need to share that gospel the message of what Jesus has done to save everyone who believes. We need to share with them the message, the same message actually the table uh, speaks to us about this morning. That Jesus lived and Jesus died so that all who would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. Well, may the Lord help us uh, to do that by his grace. Let, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to apply his word to our hearts and our souls and to change us by it.